All righty. Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you all for joining us for this morning's Beef Brunch Educational Series webinar. Uh, my name is Jason Holmes. I'll be hosting for you today. Uh, we've also got uh, Dr. Ashley Edwards on with us. We weren't for sure with her schedule this morning she'd be on or not, but uh, we've also got her on with us today. Uh, our speaker today is Mr. Vince Desitale uh, to uh, the Beef Brunch Educational Series and the Beef Brunch News Update. Vince is no stranger uh, to, uh, to the things that we do through that, uh, through that venue. Uh, Vince is the extension agent in St. Landry, Evangeline, and several other parishes, as well as our beef cattle coordinator for the Central Region. Uh, today he'll be discussing planting and planting of ryegrass. Uh, uh, I'd like to cover just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Uh, we will be muting your, your microphone, so uh, if y'all can go ahead and do that for us just to save us a couple of steps. So if you do have an open mic, uh, go ahead and mute that for us. And we ask, them, ask you that you do keep those muted throughout the webinar. If you're joining us online by the Teams app or link, please enter your questions into the Q&A box at any time during the presentation. If you're calling in, you may text your questions to me at 318-243-4931. Again, if you're calling in, you can text me questions throughout the webinar. That number is 318-243-4931. In the interest of time, we, wait, uh, we will wait to answer any questions until the end of Vince's presentation. Vince? Thank you for the taking taking your time to be with us this morning and putting this presentation together. Sure, Jason. Thank and we'll, you. All uh, we'll we'll begin at any time. Sorry about that, Vince. Go ahead. We're ready when you are. Okay, no problem. Uh, thank you all for having me, and it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, you know, here sitting in the central part of Louisiana, and man, and we're looking down the barrel of, of ryegrass planting season, uh, waking up to sixty degrees and even fifty nine this morning. Uh, makes makes you feel good about doing things. Uh, so ryegrass season is upon us. There's a lot of hay on the ground here over the last several days. Uh, looks like we have a stretch of good weather for hay making and, and leading right up into our, our ryegrass planting. So without any further ado, I'll, I'll just a uh, little bit of history about myself. Um, I've been an extension agent for approximately going on 15 years now. Uh, prior to that, working in the industry, in the ag industry, uh, running and, and managing a fertilizer plant. Uh, for one of the local uh, major uh, fertilizer distributors and, um, you know, in sales. So uh, I feel like I have a good well-rounded background for what we're going to discuss today. Having been involved, uh, I've been in a cow-calf operator for 29 years with my own herd. So uh, myself, like many of our county fellow county agents, have some skin in the game uh, when it comes to this because our passion is about our work in most cases, and uh, we certainly want to help people to make decisions about what's good choices, uh, you know, moving forward, uh, try not to overspend and save money, and those are going to be some challenging times with the cost of uh, input, uh, you know, the cost of inputs that we're faced with today uh, related to high fuel, high fertilizer, and, um, you know, those sorts of things. So we'll move forward, and, uh, you know, the, the topic of my uh, talk today is all things ryegrass, uh, utilizing ryegrass for grazing and supplemental uh, cattle feeding during the winter feeding period. So uh, our first slide, uh, you know, the largest uh, expense annually for most stockmen is the winter feeding period. So our, our, our main focus is, you know, meeting nutritional needs uh, because I think we can all agree that, uh, you know, whether you're successful or not, nutrition is the basis uh, for all successes and failures uh, when uh, we begin to have problems in, within our cattle herd. Uh, most times it's, uh, and you'll talk to your local veterinarian and they'll probably uh, ditto the same thing that, you know, most most situations are, are nutritionally driven, whether it's a success or a failure. So uh, nutrition is key, uh, keeping those, those cattle in a body condition scores of, uh, you know, fives and sixes uh, can be often challenging when we have environmental conditions uh, here in South Louisiana, such as hurricanes, uh, we're still not out of the woods yet on, on hurricane season, uh, but by golly, it feels good this morning, the last few mornings, and hopefully uh, we can keep getting these fronts to, to push these things uh, 
uh, these weather situations out of our out of the Gulf of Mexico and and keep keep everybody healthy and happy and and uh, cattle uh, grazing on on wood grasses we have because we've had a lot of an abundant amount of forages up until the last few days here uh, rains that have created you know as our pastures are in good shape uh, with forages moving into the fall so as we mentioned body condition scores uh, you know, a critical factor in in the success of our uh, cattle operations here in in central Louisiana and and anywhere in in the United States and uh, for that fact of matter anywhere that cattle are uh, bred and and calves are delivered and and calves are, are raised and brought to market uh, cows need to be in a body condition score of five and six and uh, if we get outside of those parameters we're, we're starting to uh, have issues uh, either from emaciation on the lower end when we get to threes and fours and then uh, over fat cattle at, at six you know up to six or sevens and eights are not, are not um, productive as well so um, you know so with that being said cattle cattlemen must be grass farmers when utilizing ryegrass and grazing supplemental cattle for on ryegrass so um, not only with ryegrass but uh, in general uh, cattlemen must you know they must have the considerations to be farmers. Uh, we often see uh, a lot of folks that want to get in the cattle business, and uh, the strangest things are, you know, we're getting into some higher price, and uh, you know, that end of the cycle period where you know cattle prices are moving up. Thank goodness, uh, but we also, you know, have well, I'll continue to go back to those high input costs. You know, it it costs you know, is very costly to do business today um, with you know eight hundred dollar ton fertilizer. Uh, four dollar uh, four dollar plus uh, farm fuel so um, we need to be grass farmers we we shouldn't put the cart before the horse so to speak uh, we should have you know ample forages out there for for cattle to graze and to go on and, and get their meet their nutritional requirements uh, with that being said you know uh, your soil uh, soil health is is key in doing all these things so uh, a person must focus on being a grass farmer uh, where farmers in general, farmers that are in, in the commercial, commercial production side of things, uh, they do such things as, you know, soil testing, uh, soil amendments with lime, um, and, and, you know, using commercial grade fertilizers. Uh, we, we hear this buzzword of all natural and organic and, and all these things are great and fine in a perfect world. Uh, but in today's world, if you're going to maximize production uh, where you're, you're grazing cattle, and it, you know our, our stocking rates vary as as we move to different parts of the state, um, but generally two to three acres, maybe up to four acres in Louisiana. You know, I, you get some of the more arid areas of outside of Louisiana, into uh, central Texas and into Oklahoma. Uh, that might be one per per fifty or hundred acres. So uh, you you got to know what your what your stocking rate and the means of stocking rates are for your particular soil. So. Uh, those are all big factors and all part of being grass farmers uh, while grazing cattle and uh, farming grass. So um, have have the nutritional means in place before you you put cattle out there and have the ample uh, levels of forage uh, to, to everything to be productive and, and moving forward. So some considerations for growing ryegrass uh, this year. Uh, generally, ryegrass is easily and, and generally economic, economical to establish. Uh, as we talked about input cost, uh, the big question is uh, with current input cost uh, this year is, is going to be substantially high uh, in terms of, of cost per acre and, and we'll get into some of that a little bit later. Um, but ryegrass in general uh, is, is still one of the easiest uh, things to grow uh, as far as supplementing it and grazing cattle and keeping that nutritional value in front of them. And also, you know, to to keep those body condition scores in, in check, uh, it's it's highly nutritious, it's very palatable, and can be up to 70% TDN, uh, so plus or minus 20% protein, depending on environmental conditions. Uh, and Lord knows that, you know, we can get some big uh, weather swings in Louisiana. Um, you know, over the last couple of years, we had some really uh, hard freezes that uh, kind of depleted some of our ryegrass stands and other winter clovers. Uh, you get a, a three or four or five day, uh, you know, in the single digits, uh, well, not necessarily in the single digits, but, you know, 10, 11, 12 degrees, uh, that can be decimating to our ryegrass and, and winter forages. Uh, so uh, with that in situation, you must have, you know, ample hay supplies and some other means of, of supplementing your cattle in these extreme conditions. So, um, you know, 
have close contact with some of your feed dealers in the area uh, for supplemental protein needs, such as uh, range cubes and uh, salt and meal and those kind of things. We'll cover some of those costs as, as we move forward through this presentation. So ryegrass can be easily grown with other forages such as legumes, which are ryegrass clover mix is often popular. Um, uh, in central Louisiana, we have a lot of natural clovers, uh, white clovers, the white Dutch clovers, uh, which some people consider the S1 clover. Uh, also in some of our alluvial soils, uh, as you get closer to our river uh, and, and uh, waterways, uh, we'll see a lot of Persian clover in this part of the state, uh, which is very highly nutritious for cattle. Uh, as we move into the spring months, once we start to see those uh, legumes uh, come about with uh, our annual plantings of winter forages, uh, we often get accelerated growth and, and good nutrition out of those uh, mixes. So legumes are a good option for mixing with ryegrass and other forages such as wheat and oats. Uh, wheat and oats are somewhat uh, less tolerable to wet conditions, so uh, you need to be very selective on where you want to position those as far as drainage and soil type and, and uh, assuring uh, that all the drainage is in order because uh, you know they like higher elevations and, and don't like being wet very long. So uh, oats is a good combination where you got fall calving cows uh, coming up here September, October, November. Uh, you can plant a couple of bushels of oats with 25 to 30 pounds of ryegrass seed. Uh, you'll get some real accelerated growth out of the oats early. Uh, when they graze that off, the ryegrass will be coming behind it. Uh, but it needs to be in a rotational situation where you, once you eat that forage, have that forage of the oats eaten down and allowing that ryegrass to come on, they, you'd need to have an option to move those cattle off and, uh, you know, have have some other options for them. But it is a good early forage. Uh, oats is a good early forage. Uh, we don't see a lot of wheat in this part of the state, but uh, as uh, we move further north, it may be a little more economical option for some uh, producers to plant wheat on some, you know, some of the higher sloping type grounds that, that you can get some production out of it uh, in terms of seed cost. So uh, ryegrass in general re recovers quickly from heavy grazing. Uh, you'll, you know, we get some warm spells uh, during the winter period and, and you'll see some accelerated growth. I mean, you can almost watch it grow uh, when you take cattle off of a, a patch and uh, if you're in a rotational grazing system, uh, it'll grow two or three inches in a three or four day period. So, um, you know, it's, it's very, it responds very well to warmer conditions and, and rebounds quickly. Uh, under optimum growing conditions, planting to grazing, um, if you're going to do a prepared seed bed, uh, generally you'll see some grazing options at 50 days. Uh, we've seen that before, um, but generally 60 to 70 days. Um, it may be considerably longer when you're grazing overseeded sod plantings. Uh, if you're going to overseed waiting on rain to germinate your seed, uh, that would possibly be in the January to February time frame. And then a lot of our natural clovers would be coming at that time. So that's a good option uh, for, for your spring uh, calving cows. Uh, if you're going to have enough hay sources on hand and also some uh, other supplemental options for protein uh, moving into that period, waiting on sod seeded ryegrass. So uh, your prepared seed bed is going to be a, a quicker um, stand establishment and more noticeable naturally because you don't have your other warm season forages that are desiccated, um, kind of hiding your stand, but uh, side seeded, just remember that side seeded, as I think most most of you that are on the on this call are, are listening in, um, you know, it's just a later later stand establishment into January, maybe February. So some general requirements for growing ryegrass, and this is all some, uh, you know, steps going back to being, being a farmer uh, or a grass farmer, so to speak. Um, growing ryegrass is possible just about on any soil type, uh, but naturally, you know, we have different soil types in Louisiana. Um, when we're along our alluvial soils, you know, we have, um, you know, better, you typically find higher pHs, uh, typically in the six to seven range and some even over seven in some of the clay type soils, which you would probably want to avoid planting ryegrass on because in the wintertime, uh, clay type soils would be uh, a little bit less uh, I guess approachable or uh, navigable by cattle. You know, it's uh, cattle don't do good on heavy clay soils in, in our river bottom areas. So concentrate on uh, your uh, higher elevation type soils, and generally those soils are going to have a little bit lower pH sometimes in the five to five five, maybe up to six. Um, so soil testing and a very very important step in the process. Uh, you should never guess on your soil tests or what your soil 
uh, requirements are or what nutrients are there. It's a simple test that provides pH levels and uh, some available nutrients present in the soil. Um, and certainly if uh, lime is required, uh, if you want some slightly acid type soils, uh, lime may be a, uh, you know, good option uh, you know, to go ahead and make those amendments. Uh, fall is a good time of the year to make soil amendments with lime. So uh, do your soil testing uh, and have that on hand to know what, what's required. If not only for your, uh, your winter forages, it, it's always a, a good tool uh, for your warm season forages to have an idea where your benchmark is. So, so water requirements, uh, moderate amounts of water throughout the growing period, uh, excessive amounts is never good for ryegrass. Uh, it, it will not perform uh, very well on the uh, saturated and soggy soils, which some of our large cattle herds in, in central part of Louisiana are in rotation with, with some rice ground. So uh, some of these producers will uh, fly in uh, and, and you know, cultivate their ryegrass stands in rice stubble, uh, which it all it goes unsaid that rice is grown with with saturated soils and water, so uh, that ryegrass is, is subject to you know some soggy conditions as well. So uh, drainage is key in, in th those scenarios, uh, but we tend to have a lot of large acreages planted into that scenario, and um, you know if we get a, a wet condition, contrary to last uh, fall and winter, we had very dry conditions where. Uh, rubber boots were not necessary for most days of feeding hay and uh, checking on cattle, and it, that was it was very very nice to have that situation. Uh, but a typical uh, winter period um, in central and south Louisiana is um, you know saturated and soggy, and some of these larger operations that operate in a rice rotation where they they'll sow ryegrass seed into the rice double um, can can get wet. Uh, so those uh, scenarios tend not to work the best in most cases, but it is a, a management practice that is used and, and, it, and it does work in, in, in where it's used. So weather conditions, uh, you know, periodic sunny and warm days are optimum for growth and performance. Uh, you know, scorching heat is not preferred. So um, as, as we getting these cooler nights uh, with this uh, fir first front we're having experience today and tomorrow and the next days, uh, it's, it's gonna wanna entice you to wanna do those things, uh, but it, extended forecast calls for 90 degree days. Uh, and that's a little too hot for uh, you know for putting out warm season, uh, cool season grasses into our, our situation. But it's time to start preparing. So that uh, you know we we certainly uh, don't want to plan into these these warm hot days because uh, that brings about another issue, and that's some of the pests that we often encounter. Uh, there are several uh, species of army worms uh, that can pose a threat to our rye, early ryegrass stands, uh, primarily the fall army worm. But a few years back we had a an outbreak of beet army worms, which are considerably harder to control uh, than the fall army worm. With that being said, the fall army worm, we've seen some resistance in some of the commonly used uh, insecticides. Um, so be on the lookout for that, uh, even in, in your hay fields. Uh, if you hadn't harvested your last cutting of hay yet, uh, you, you might run some uh, risk of seeing some army worm outbreaks. Uh, but be, be on the vigilant side of things whenever you're planting that first uh, ryegrass planting because uh, we can have a normal worm situation can be devastating to our ryegrass crop. So pl planting too early in warmer conditions is where the greatest risk of issues are with army worms. Some disease issues are poss a possibility if the environmental conditions are favorable. Uh, we, we have seen some rust issues uh, identified in, in ryegrass, but as cooler fall weather conditions persist, we uh, generally don't see those problems. So now we'll jump into fer fertilization. Uh, you know, that's another key component as being a grass farmer and a cattleman uh, in all rolled up in one. A pre-plant fertilizer application is generally required to ensure, you know, that you get early stand establishment. Uh, ryegrass responds well to any fertilizer program. And I think that's the biggest drawback we have and I see as a county agent, uh, you know, I get often comments, uh, you know, uh, you know, I don't plant ryegrass because it doesn't work for me. That's a typical comment I get, you know, uh, if you're not budgeting in for fertilizer and, and applying fertilizer and all the management practices that go along with growing ryegrass, uh, it's not going to work for you. So uh, plan some options uh, as far as uh, making the fertilizer and for soil fertility uh, in order to, uh, you know, to get that ryegrass stand up early and, um, and, and get it going. 
depending on the planting method, whether it's overseeding uh, or prepared seed bed, a basic pre-plant application may consist of a blend uh, of uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, uh, such as a 9-18-36, and, and with you know, eight to 10 units of sulfur. Uh, sulfur is ve very critical for, for a grass crop, um, so keep that in mind, and uh, it, it's better received if you put it down early with, with a pre-plant uh, blend. Uh, generally, 100 to 125 pounds per acre uh, is recommended uh, depending on soil type, and you can check with your local extension agent or fertilizer distributor for what type of fertilizer they're putting out. Um, in a broadcast planting, planting method with over sod or prepared seed bed, applying fertilizer at planting is also serves as a carrier for applying seed uh, more consistently. So your fertilizer distributor and uh, or uh, you know, blend plant can they can often you know they'll give you the option of mixing your ryegrass seed and supplying with the spreader cord. It may be at an additional cost uh, for depending on tonnage that you use, uh, but they do supply spreader cords for applying these, and it works quite well um, as far as mixing fertilizer and your ryegrass seed in a blend to be uh, distributed. Uh, if you're drill planting, uh, and that has become a popular method uh, with with soil conservation practices in place. Uh, fertilizer applications, uh, pre-drilling would be preferred. Uh, most times it's neglected, and uh, that's where we see poor performance with drilled ryegrass seed. Um, if you're going to drill your ryegrass seed with a no-till type drill, um, still, you know, budget in that fertilizer application, and uh, your success will be greater than, than you anticipated uh, if, it, if it hadn't been real good for you. So now we'll cover the you know, nitrogen requirements for ryegrass. Uh, nitrogen is, is really a critical, the most critical success uh, for success in growing ryegrass. Uh, it's very responsive to nitrogen fertilizer. Uh, general recommendation is to apply 40 to 60 actual pounds of nitrogen. Uh, so when we talk about actual pounds, we're talking units, um, not a blend. So per se, uh, we're talking about urea in general. Urea is 46% nitrogen. So 100 pounds of urea would give you 46 units. So anywhere from 90 to 130 pounds of, of urea. Um, once you see a stand establishment, you getting you know two to three leaf ryegrass uh, would be an opportune time to apply that first shot of nitrogen. Um, now take it with a grain of salt. Now nitrogen prices are in the probably the seven to eight hundred dollar range at this current time. So, um, you know, it's going to be a costly venue for growing ryegrass this year, uh, nonetheless. So uh, I think at this time last year, uh, ryegrass, uh, urea prices were somewhere in the, the three to five hundred dollar range, somewhere around four hundred dollars. And with the onset of the Ukraine war, I mean, I, I was experiencing it firsthand. I, I was putting out uh, my second shot of top dress on ryegrass last year, last year, well, in February, the day before the war started and the day after it had gone up $125 a ton. So uh, keep that in mind, uh, it's gonna be expensive, um, but generally 100 to 125 pounds uh, per acre uh, and generally requires two shots after you graze off that first grazing from say December to February, somewhere in there, that first 60 days, uh, then applying another shot of 100 pounds of urea, uh, maybe some ammonium sulfate mix uh, in early February to mid-February when ground conditions allow to get on it, uh, with a tractor and a spreader buggy. Um, in, the, in the event of a wet conditions, um, you know, don't hesitate to use an airplane if you're going to want to get the, the best bang for your buck. I know it's an added uh, $10, $12 an acre, but uh, sometimes you just got to get it out there when you, you got those calves growing. You know, we're faced with, you know, some $2 five weight calves right now. Uh, I've heard some people that sold calves this week that uh, they netted over a thousand, over a thousand bucks per head, that's heifers and steers mixed on a load. So uh, it's getting getting to a little bit more favorable market situation to do these kind of things. So some grazing practices we want to mention, um, you know, most cattle producers who consistently grow, grow ryegrass uh, manage their forage availability uh, in several different ways. Uh, rotational grazing is a good option. However, uh, you must know it's labor intense, uh, requires some temporary fencing, or multiple pastures with permanent fencing uh, to extend that grazing period. And we talk about extending grazing period. You know, we think about if you stop and think about it, you start grazing ryegrass that you have a good established stand in December. Uh, we basically graze ryegrass for 
four and a half to five months, uh, even up to six months with ideal conditions. We had a cool May last year and a cool May this year. We had ryegrass till about the, the mid part of May. Um, so that gave us like five and a half months of grazing on some highly intense managed ryegrass uh, that's very palatable, very nutritious and very, very um, you know, appropriate for, for growing calves for the, for the market. So we talked about time grazing uh, on smaller uh, planted acreages. Uh, time grazing is an option, however, labor intense, uh, one planting, one site, but it can extend the forage availability. Uh, this is in the case of you, you put cows out on ryegrass, you know, if they ate for an hour and lay down, it's time for them to be out. So um, it's giving them time to lay down is, is if, if you're going to be managing them that intensely and micromanaging comes to mind at this point, uh, let them graze for an hour and get them out. Uh, they'll meet their nutritional daily needs, uh, their daily, daily nutritional needs, grazing an hour to two hours a day. Uh, anything over that, you know, they, they've probably, uh, they're probably just wasting some of your uh, expensive forages at that point. So as we talk, we'll talk continuous grazing, uh, you know, naturally it's less labor intense. Uh, and I, I mentioned some of these larger plantings in, in, in the central part of Louisiana uh, where, you know, people just, uh, some producers turn cattle out and they'll graze it down. Uh, and in this case, it's less labor intense, but more expensive on fertilizer costs. Um, and will will eventually cost you more in hay uh, because, uh, you know, when you, you have grazed all your forages down, waiting on that second shot of fertilizer uh, to, to put it out. Uh, sometimes we have adverse weather conditions in uh, that time of uh, early February uh, to, to early March. Um, so be conscious of that, that uh, continuous grazing. Uh, if you mob graze uh, these larger plantings, uh, you, you can find yourself without any forages to graze in the most critical period in, in February and March. So um, be cautious about that. Um, you will have to have possibly some alternative means of uh, protein supplements, uh, such as uh, some of these liquid feeds and uh, feed tubs, uh, which uh, all of those have increased in price with uh, uh, you know supply chain delays and all that shipping and all the feed distributors. So uh, you're looking at you know some of these protein tubs at being 120 bucks a piece. Um, you know some of this liquid feed has gone up considerably because of uh, high fuel costs and, and transportation. So. Keep those things in mind, and, and uh, we might need to become more micromanagers than than we have in the past uh, to kind of get the best bang for our buck. So when we talk about stocking rates, and that's probably one of the other, uh, I guess, pet peeves I have as I go around as a county agent. Uh, if if someone has 10 acres and think they can put 10 cows on it, that's not the case at all. Uh, rotational and time grazing will allow for more animals to graze per acre. Uh, so you. In this fashion, you control the amount of time allowed to graze, as we talked about earlier, uh, managing their forage, the forage amount present. So, I mean, you can you can kind of dictate what happens if you become a micromanager with your ryegrass. Uh, it's best applied when using uh, with dry cows during the winter feeding period. Uh, so you generally can grow or have one grown cow per per half acre on uh, if you're going to micromanage uh, what plantings you do make. Uh, so in a continuous grazing system, uh, it allows for fewer cows per planted acre. Uh, there's not many control mechanisms in place for conserving forages. It's kind of a, a mob grazing. Uh, and, if, and if you're not managing it real close, you, you can run out of forage, and, um, but you need to be cautious of that. Um, forages can be depleted from overgrazing. As a result, uh, it can have an added uh, additional cost of fertilizer. Uh, some of these folks that uh, Plant ryegrass on large scale, they, they will fertilize up to three times uh, per year uh, with an airplane. And uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a cost bearing effect for them as much as if you're trying to micromanage. So if you have, you, you have the financial resources to do those things, uh, I say go for it, but you know, it's, it's, it's gonna be a costly venue. Uh, additional hay may be needed uh, when forages are depleted. So you may have some extended uh, windows of feeding hay um, intermittently through your ryegrass grazing. So fall and winter calf herds, um, it's, it's important that, you know, they have that uh, extra forages, those winter forages for grazing uh, to keep that milk production in, uh, in order because a cow reaches her uh, milk production peak at 60 days uh, postpartum. So it's important from that day of uh, parturition to 60 days 
uh, that's when the calf is uh, the milk and colostrum and milk requirements are the greatest. So from zero to 60, uh, you need to be thinking about having whatever whatever they can have in front of them uh, to, to make maximize production to get that calf off to a good healthy start. Implementing a rota rotational grazing system within multiple acres, uh, large acreage plantings would be suggested. So in the case of, uh, you know, I mentioned some of some areas that, you know, they'll grow uh, ryegrass and uh, behind rice. Um, so have a system where you can uh, move these cattle around and, and take take advantage of uh, some fairly inexpensive uh, electric fencing systems that we have. Uh, and once you get cows uh, fence broke, they uh, they generally will uh, respect that very well. So in these larger plantings, one to two acres per cow is often recommended, uh, you know, to meet their requirements. So that kind of sums up some of what we've talked about in regards to managing and micromanaging. So the more time that cattle graze, the less labor intense the winter feeding uh, period will be for not only the producer, but for the cattle. Uh, the cattle will experience uh, improved feed efficiency uh, with less need for hay and other supplementation. So uh, anytime that you can uh, lessen the amount of uh, interruption or move cattle and uh, you know their, their feed efficiency will go up. So uh, minimizing and once they get acclimated, uh, if you're in a rotation or time grazing, uh, they hear that four wheeler or that side by side crank or the pickup truck, they know the sound of your pickup truck. Uh, I've witnessed it myself. Uh, they start coming off the grass as soon as they see the first movement or hear the first sound that they recognize. So uh, get your cattle acclimated early on. If you're going to get into a time uh, or rotational grazing system, uh, it really works well and it, it can be a, a cost saver. So uh, we'll go over some cool season pasture and forage crops that are available to us. Um, and this is a, a resource that Dr. Ed Twidwell puts out every year. Um, related to our cool season pasture and forage crop varieties. Um, so, you know, we mentioned oats and there's several varieties of oats that uh, do real well. Um, I've known people to even buy feed oats and use them uh, where we talked about, you know, applying uh, two bushels of oats per acre with uh, 25, 30 pounds, maybe 35 pounds of ryegrass seed. Um, some of those uh, oats uh, will germinate and, and grow off to be good forages, but some of these uh, identified varieties like the ram varieties uh, uh, will work well. So as we talk about ryegrass varieties, there are a, a number of them. Uh, diamond tea, double diamond, early uh, tetraploids, uh, you name it. I mean, we, you know, the prime, the marshal, all of these, uh, Tam Tebow, uh, th these varieties are all good varieties, uh, depending on your situation and your experiences with them. Uh, I often get comments from uh, producers that, you know, they'll say they've tried them all and one works the best for them. Um, but, you know, specifically, uh, they all going to work for you given the opportunity with the ample fertilization and, and soil fertility and drainage uh, in place. I think you'll get good results from almost any one of these varieties. Granted, some of them are a little bit higher yielding, um, but also you need to take with a grain of salt that your distributor or seed supplier may only have um, some of these varieties and not all. So uh, be cautious of that. And uh, it's, it's about time to start uh, making your, your ryegrass seed planting intentions known to your distributor because um, there may be some, there's not expected to have any uh, supply delays, but uh, if there is, you, you wanna get your intentions uh, in place with your, with your salesperson. Uh, as far as wheat, you know, there's no commercial varieties that have been tested. Um, you know, oftentimes you'll find what's labeled as a pasture wheat uh, with your local distributor. So uh, if you're planning on planting wheat with your ryegrass or wheat along, uh, make sure your planting intentions are known. Uh, as we go through some of the legumes, uh, we often get the, the question of alfalfa. Uh, the, you know, can we grow it in Louisiana? Yes, you can grow it in Louisiana. But as far as uh, you know, growing it and curing it for hay, uh, as as most of you know, it, you know, we mentioned about cutting hay early on in the presentation. Uh, you know, our environmental conditions are pretty tough about growing alfalfa and curing it for hay. So yes, it can be grown, uh, but somewhat susceptible to some diseases and environmental conditions are often limiting or the limiting factor as far as uh, making hay with it and curing it, but it can be grown. In fact, Jason Holmes has, has some work going on with alfalfa in the northern part of the state. Uh, some of the other legumes, uh, clovers uh, that are listed here, arrowleaf clover, uh, bursine clovers, crimson clover, red clovers, uh, they're, they're all good and grow well with our ryegrass plantings. 
uh, I think that the, the old standby is the white clover. Um, but if you know, you need to be cautious if you're uh, you know going to graze some ryegrass clover mixes. Uh, it's introduce cattle slowly to it because uh, we all know that clover bloat can be an issue, and you want to acclimate cattle slowly. So in a in a timed or or, or rotational grazing situation, uh, acclimate them slowly to it so they don't overeat and uh, cattle coming from a dry lot situation into a green uh, forage that's where you'll see uh, most of your, your bloat situation so uh, be cautious of that and and uh, just mindful of clover bloat so seeding rates of, of some of the varieties that we you know and the plantings that we talked about um, you know planted alone uh, oats you would want to plant I, I mentioned two bushels which is about 100 pounds per acre uh, in a mixture uh, you'd want to plant 60 uh, I've experienced that. I, I planted uh, 100 pounds to the acre and got a good stand out of it because you often will have some uh, some stand loss or germination issues uh, depending on what oats you use. Um, annual ryegrass, uh, which is predominantly going to be a standalone, um, planted alone. You know the recommendation is 30 pounds. Uh, I've heard producers tell me that oh that's not nearly enough. They plant 50 pounds to the acre. We have to go over some of the cost uh, relationships with uh, planting uh, ryegrass this year. You might want to consider uh, following a standard planting rate. Um, some people go 40, 45. Um, I think 40 is, is a good number uh, where we have some environmental conditions or if you have to get in a situation where you plant into some pastures that stay wet and you want to reinsure yourself that you got early stand establishment. Uh, wheat is generally recommended uh, to be planted at 90 pounds per acre. And uh, your uh, different legumes, your clovers, um, you know, generally from five to eight, maybe 10 pounds an acre, uh, depending. But you got to take into consideration the cost of these clover seeds, I would say, is probably in the neighborhood of around $400 for a 50 pound bag at this point in time. So um, it's all a cost relation to what uh, is economically sound or stable uh, for your situation and what you, what you can do. So some planning costs in 2022, um, you know, as I mentioned, seed cost is is about what it was last year, uh, but the number I was given in talking to one of our local seed distributor, uh, we're looking at $40 for a 50 pound bag. At a planting rate of 35 pounds per acre, which is, is pretty standard for most people planting uh, in a ryegrass planting alone, you're looking at $43.75 per acre. Uh, your pre-plant fertilizer at 125, 125 pounds per acre that we mentioned earlier in a, a, a complete, uh, say with a 9, 18, 36, and maybe eight units of sulfur, uh, you're looking at about uh, $54 an acre, um, providing that, you know, and the number that was given to me, the most blends are run about $850 per, per ton today. So uh, nitrogen at two applications, uh, you're looking at $50 per acre of application. So by the time it's all said and done, before equipment costs, you're looking at 200 over 200 bucks an acre for planting ryegrass in 2022. So uh, you, we we use the term of micromanaging. Uh, if you're going to use ryegrass into your winter feeding period plan, uh, you need to plan to be a micromanager here moving forward. So uh, estimated equipment cost is going to run uh, 10 to 12 bucks an acre, and if you do have that airplane trip in a wet condition. Uh, in February and March, uh, you can add an additional uh, 12 bucks an acre or more for that. So the big question uh, is utilizing ryegrass as a forage, you know, is it for everyone and for every producer? Absolutely not. Uh, we, you know, we have producers that, uh, again, you know, we, we live and die by some of the things they tell us and some of the things we see and we don't want to see uh, as an extension agent. Um, and I know for myself, it's it's been a a challenge to understand some of the things that some people do and uh, do do we as extension agents and our passion for cattle and doing what we do do what we do is is it perfect no uh, is it right for everyone no is ryegrass right for everyone no uh, but you know some some of the old timers will say hay and salt and meal is the way they go and, and they get get by fine with it um, also utilizing uh, cubes and and some other protein sources, and we'll get into that here shortly, but uh, that that's an option for you. So when we talk about planting sites, um, you need to utilize acres that are well drained. That's bottom line. Uh, go to your higher ends of, of what acres you graze. 
uh, isolate those uh, 10, 12, 15, 20 acres. Uh, it may be four or five different locations. Um, identify those well-drained areas and concentrate your plantings on there. Uh, use your fertilizers, use your, uh, your best, best management practices uh, to the utmost in those areas and concentrate on that. Um, if cattle got to traverse through mud and, and, and belly deep water uh, to get to where they're eating ryegrass, uh, you're, you're running your feed efficiency down as far as your grazings are concerned. So ensure that drainage is adequate, open out outlets uh, immediately after planting, because I mean, I've seen it where uh, ryegrass uh, stands or ryegrass plantings are made and we get a deluge of rain or a hurricane comes in. Uh, so you want to ensure that your drainage is in place. As I mentioned, multiple smaller fields uh, with higher elevations. Uh, then you want to, you know, easy access for cattle entering with equipment and, you know, wind fertilizing, spraying and haying, because uh, that brings to another mind, uh, you know, that ryegrass makes some fantastic hay. Uh, baleage has, has become a, a popular practice for most of Louisiana's cattle uh, industry. Um, you know, the biggest limiting factor with baleage is, is the cost of the equipment. Uh, but oftentimes you can rent a wrapper from some of your local equipment dealers. Uh, so when we're offsetting the high feed cost, uh, baleage can make a, a real, real good uh, forage and, and feed uh, supplement uh, if you're going to retain replacement heifers or stockers or something of that nature. Uh, baleage can be a, a high source of protein, very palatable, highly nutritious to um, either growing stockers or, or feeding uh, replacement heifers and even and grown cows. So uh, as we get into some cost comparison for 150 day feeding period, which is uh, generally uh, about five months at, at 30 days, you know, uh, ryegrass is going to run about 215 bucks per, per acre. Uh, if you're in a rotational or time grazing system, it'll cost you roughly, you know, so you take that number and divide it up. Uh, by those days about $107 per head, uh, which will be 72 cents per day, uh, depending on, on uh, your grazing period and environmental conditions. So if you're in a continuous grazing system at one acre per cow, um, you know, it's going to run you about $215 per head for the, for the uh, grazing period or for the winter feeding period of 150 days, uh, which is equivalent to about a dollar and 43 cents per head per day. Um, so with that being said, um, it, it's a costly venue and, and, and going to be one of the more expensive venues for, for supplementing and, and uh, keeping those cows through that winter feeding period. As we mentioned, salt and meal is a good old standby for most older producers that don't believe in ryegrass. And uh, that uh, source of protein can be 25 to 28 uh, percent. You're looking, depending on at one to two pounds uh, from, from 20 to 40 cents per head per day. Uh, but you you need to keep in mind that you need better than 7% protein hay uh, if you're going to get in a salt and meal uh, feeding system because it's just not going to meet their daily nutritional requirements. When we talk about range cubes, uh, range cubes are not fed in Louisiana very often uh, because we typically have wet ground. Uh, we don't have good feeding areas. We don't have good bunk areas. Um, wet conditions usually are the limiting factor for feeding cubes. Uh, but uh, looked at some prices this week, uh, $640 a ton, and it's generally recommended to feed two to five pounds per head per day uh, with a three pound average, and you're looking at 96, 96 cents per head per day. Uh, that's about a 40% protein product. So uh, I know in, in bad weather situations, I've used cubes myself and a number of other producers. So if there is a forecast of bad weather coming eight to 10, 12 days, out uh, that you can see it coming, get with one of your local feed dealers and get you uh, what you would think the, the, the time span of the weather event's going to be, uh, have enough cubes on hand to supplement those cows. Because uh, if we get a hard ice and you got ryegrass for your cows, your ryegrass is gone, uh, they're burning up hay, uh, they're, you're losing hay because of, of just uh, environmental conditions and then cows want to get in the hay for you know keeping warm. Uh, so get those energy requirements, meet their energy requirements, get that energy level up to keep them warm uh, through that period. But uh, plan to, again, micromanage uh, ahead of time if you know of a bad weather event coming with ice or, or very, very low temperature. Uh, and again, with uh, in central and south Louisiana, we, you know, we predominantly all herds have a certain percentage of Brahmin in them. Um, so those energy requirements go way up on Brahmin type cattle. Uh, 
So you want to make sure that you start feeding and get that energy level up three to five days ahead of the ice event so that they can sustain their body temperatures through that event. So we'll cover some hay consumption, just general. Uh, we could go into this and debate it all day long. Uh, so a 1,200-pound cow will require 2% of its body weight per day, which is about 24 uh, uh, 24 pounds per day of dry matter. <clears throat> so that's at a 7% protein. So a 4 by 5 bale of hay, roughly about 800 pounds, and you can figure 15% incidental loss through feeding and or storage if it's stored outside. So you roughly get about 680 pounds uh, of hay in a, a 4 by 5 bale, and I use a 4 by 5 bale because that's uh, the most commonly baled hay, uh, bale, bale size and baling hay, um, and most producers use those because um, our general uh, standard for, um, you know, our cattle herds are generally from 25 to 50 head is a national standard, and uh, most people have smaller equipment and use 4 by 5 bales. So in a 4 by 5 bale of hay, after you take out your 15% incidental loss, uh, you'll end up with about four, uh, 680 pounds. Of, of hay that's that's usable. So in 150 days, one cow will utilize about 3,600 pounds of hay. Uh, so that's four and a half, four by five round bales per cow. So at a cost of about $55 per bale, uh, you're looking at $247.50 per cow. And over 150 days, uh, you can expect a uh, dollar and 65 cents per day per head. So that's just some general, some general numbers that I put together. I think it would represent uh, what your daily cost would be uh, in the event that you choose one of these uh, directions for supplementing or grazing cattle on ryegrass and using either salt and meal or range cubes. So in summary, uh, plan on treating your planted acres as a ryegrass as a crop. Uh, again, I'll go back to that uh, and I, I truly believe in that. If you tre treat it as a crop with all the necessary uh, you know, fertilizer amendments uh, that you need based on your soil type uh, and, and planting it in the right locations, uh, you're going to get uh, a lot of benefit out of growing rye, growing rye grass. Uh, again, choose the most appropriate planting site with good drainage, um, soil test, uh, inputs are far too expensive not to know what is needed for your general soil type. Plan to use fertilizer at planting and as a top dress to, gra to, to your grass crop. Uh, that, that's where the benefits are. Plan out your stocking rates for your particular operation. Um, not every operation is the same by any stretch. Uh, so know what your, your stocking rates are, uh, know what your, what your soils and your forage crops uh, can, can comfortably accommodate and, and be proactive on that. Have an adequate amount of hay supply for the winter feeding period. Uh, it's always good to have 15 to 20, even 30 percent more hay that you anticipate needing. Uh, if we get into one of these severe weather events uh, where you got to rely strictly on hay and uh, and or some supplemental feeding uh, in the terms of salt and meal or cubes to keep those energy levels up, you will require more hay uh, to, to keep your cows sustained through that period. Uh, to reduce feed costs and improve winter feeding efficiency by grazing only lactating cows, um, is is very common, uh, so we want to keep that in mind. Um, you know, if 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 the cost of doing business, uh, feeding your lactating cows, uh, the ryegrass, and separating your dry uh, spring calving cows out to a different herd uh, will save you money. Uh, just it will be more labor intensive because you will spend more time with those dry cows in in some ways. So utilize hay and other protein sources or supplements for dry cows. Um, you know, that's kind of what we mentioned previously. Uh, it's just some some different protein sources may be needed for dry cows as it will be for uh, lactating cows, but concentrate your lactating cows for your uh, winter uh, plantings of either ryegrass and uh, oats or wheat and or uh, some legumes that come in early spring. You can find some uh, the 2022 ryegrass budget estimates. Dr. Kirk Gidry made those available to us here recently, and you can go to LSU's uh, website at www.lsuagcenter.com to find those. And that basically will conclude my, my presentation. Uh, I have included my contact information here on this slide um, um, in the central region. Uh, so I have access to a lot of the state. I can be almost anywhere in the state in three hours. I know we have other agents that work throughout the state and we uh, collaborate with one another. So if you have questions, you can call me and 
I can defer you to one of those agents that are in those parts of the state, uh, but I happy, would be happy to visit with you on the, on the phone about what your situation is or uh, what you have questions about. So uh, it's been a pleasure presenting to you today and I just wanted to put this picture up here. We went on to Texarkana to the Fourth States Fair. My daughter was grand champion bull there this past weekend, so we're extremely proud of that. And that same bull won grand champion in Houston as a yearling uh, earlier this year. So kudos to my daughter and, and her project. But um, you can make your recommendations or go to the, uh, the QR code here um, and, and do the um, evaluation of this talk and this program. Uh, we certainly want to get your feedback on, on what we've uh, provided to you and moving forward. You can also visit our Beef Brunch educational series by visiting LSU's Ag Center website, Beef Brunch uh, portal. Jason, that's about all I have at this time. Thank you, Vince. I appreciate it. If you'll back up one slide back to that QR code, I'd appreciate it. So if you are viewing us on the live stream today, or even if you're viewing the recording of this at a later time, we ask that you do take a few minutes and complete that uh, the evaluation, the survey of the of the program today. There's a couple of ways you can do this. You can use the camera on your phone and uh, view the QR code that you see here on the screen. Uh, click the banner that appears and it'll go straight to the survey. You can also access the link in the Q&A box if you're viewing this live, or you can access the link in the video and podcast description if you're viewing the recording of this talk today. Uh, Vince, I don't see, let me look one more time, make sure I don't see anything in the chat or the Q&A box. No, I'm not seeing anything. Dr. Edwards, are you seeing anything at this time? No, sir, I'm trying to get that uh, survey code posted real quick. I think so you're going to put that, go you're gonna put that in the Q&A box for us? Yes, sir, it should. It says it's going through, but my Wi-Fi is not the best right now, so hopefully it's gone through. Yes, it's there. I can see it now. So I, I don't see any other questions. All right. So uh, uh, with that being said, we'll be posting this recording online within the next week or so. It'll be able to, you'll be able to find that on the LSU Ag Center dash livestock YouTube channel. It'll also be on our Beef Brunch webpage located at lsuagcenter.com forward slash Beef Brunch under past webinars. More information will be on our Beef Brunch website. Lastly, if you have any other questions regarding the Beef Brunch Educational Series, please feel free to contact Dr. Ashley Edwards at akedwards at agcenter.lsu.edu. I'm still not seeing any questions, so we appreciate y'all joining us today. Vince, thank you again for uh, uh, for putting this presentation today. I uh, believe that's some really, really good timely information as we get ready for ryegrass planting season. Uh, we appreciate it and hope you have a good rest of your day. Thank you, Jason.